The main advantage of the axe is the hook under the blade. Here we go again. Shadow If you like dark, mature, epic fantasy with a strong focus on world-building, dynamic characters, structured and satisfied magic systems, then I highly suggest you check out my novel, Chronicles of Everfall, Shadow of the Conqueror. It's available in print, ebook, and audiobook, narrated by Michael Kramer and Kate Redding. I'm also producing a graphic novel adaptation of my book with Mike S. Miller, a very comic book artist who has worked with George R. R. Martin and DC Comics Injustice. There are links to everything mentioned in the description below. Greetings, I'm Shad, and it feels like 2017 again, which is a nice thought, I mean, because, you know, we've all loved 2020 so much. <laughs> anyway, so a while ago I made a reply video to Game Theory, as made by Matt Pat, in regards to a video he did on the video game For Honor, and uh, it looks like it's time to do it again, because Matt has released a video uh, looking at some of the fun things in the new Assassin's Creed game, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and unfortunately there are a number of of significant factual errors, but to Matt's credit, he's done better this time around than last time. And before we get into it, I want to make it perfectly clear this is not an attack on Matt Pat. I actually think Matt is a great guy, okay? And his content is lighthearted and fun. My kids love it, okay? They're watching Game Theory quite regularly. And I th also I think it's quite clear that his content isn't made to be taken too seriously, because as we know, they're just theories. A game theory, right? Right? But uh, having said that, that doesn't make uh, what he says, whenever he says something in an authoritative way, that doesn't make him immune to scrutiny, especially because his theories, he tr does his best to try and found them on uh, evidence and facts. And that is very much what we see here, where he's theorizing and is trying to found his theory crafting on historical evidence and that's where we run into some issues because as well as Matt Pat does in many videos it looks like he has a bit of a blind spot when it comes to historical accuracy and uh, I don't blame him too, well, some of these things are like, don't take too much, you know, research to actually find the correct answers, but knowing where to start and understanding the correct context is something that I've devoted most of my life to, honestly, and uh, it's very easy to go astray. Last time around, there was actually quite a bit of a response to Matt Pat's uh, For Honor video, and I wasn't the only one who replied to him. There was actually a number of us that did it as well. Me, Metatron, Scarlagrim, and even some smaller YouTubers like, uh, uh, Snap Jelly was a smaller one that also did a good reply. And so uh, I understand if Matt actually didn't watch all those videos because it could have felt like a bit like it was dogpiling. And I hope this time around it doesn't come across that way because I'm doing it in good faith, okay? I, like I said, I think Matt is a great guy and I'm purely doing it to just correct factual errors about a subject that I am deeply interested in. My entire YouTube channel is focused around it. And last time the Metatron actually made an offer to Matt Pat that if he ever comes across one of these subjects again all he need do is reach out but as I mentioned I kind of understand if he never saw it when a lot of criticism is lobbed against you even if it's valid sometimes it's just mentally healthy to just ignore it but unfortunately it means we might not see the error of our mistakes and I'll reiterate that invitation that Metatron offered that Matt if you ever come across this subject again please feel free to reach out it's really easy to find my business contact through YouTube I know you know how to do it and I would have been more than happy to just review the script like just as a friendly gesture to point out some of the areas in which you might have been going wrong and more than happy to do that for you in the future as well because like I said you make great content and if there's a way that I might be able to help you in the area of my own expertise to make your content as good as possible it would be my pleasure to do so. So with that out of the way we need to get into the specifics the nitty-gritty now of the errors that do come up in Matt Pat's video on Assassin's Creed Valhalla. I've moved into the shade so I don't give myself heat stroke in this hot sunny day and also I'm going to be using my archery range as well so this is a, a good location to continue and uh, I did mention I'm going to be getting the video I just wanted to add on one small little thing that I understand what it's like Matt we wade through some dangerous waters on YouTube in the educational adjacent kind of sphere we're more kind of entertainers yet we do get the opportunity to educate and because of that I feel 
until we get put under a much greater level of scrutiny. But the easiest way to resolve any issues when we make mistakes is just to correct them. It's, a, it's as simple as that. And I do it regularly. I've done it on my channel just recently in regards to sword frogs or sword carriages, which is this thing right here. Because I'm not making this video to be negative or to send hate your way in any measure. And I don't want anyone to be doing that to Matt either. But when we make mistakes and are called out on them, which happens to me regularly, that, that the sword frog thing was in response to someone calling me out on it, the easiest way to resolve it is just to correct it. And it's an opportunity to make more interesting content, which actually just adds to your credibility because it shows that you're willing to learn. The main subject of Matt's video is the concept of dual wielding, using two weapons at the same time. And then he explores how historically accurate the idea is, and then different combinations about uh, the difference of weapons that you can use in your offhand, dual wielding to your axes and then two shields and then he also talks about they just the, these are the main subjects he talks about being able to shoot someone's head off with an arrow so those are the main things i'm going to be addressing for those who aren't familiar dual wielding is when you use two weapons one in each hand and initially this seems like it should be a great idea right wrong think about it you can only really be offensive with one arm one weapon or one side of your body at a time no that 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 is incorrect implying that because you always have one side facing an opponent which isn't always so sometimes you face more on like this, that the second weapon's offensive advantage isn't going to be that huge. It isn't like hit, 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 and every strike is about as fast as you can do one-handed. No, because the way you strike can actually make it much faster where when one weapon is you know, being retracted, the other weapon can actually move forward and attack. And so because of that, you can actually attack in very fast succession to one another, uh, dual wielding. Which already is going to be taking a lot of training. Half the time, that part of your body is just going to be rendered useless, or at least less effective. It's not an efficient strategy. And he does later clarify this, that more often than not, when dual wielding, the second weapon is actually used as a defensive item. The other thing is opening up your opponents with the forward attacking by, you Know, doing a feint and then hitting low or something like that. And so there's actually a lot of offensive advantage in using two weapons. Battles are all about a balance of offense and defense, coming up with solid defenses until it's the right time to strike, which is why throughout history, something used for offense, like an ax or a sword, is so often paired with something focused more around defense, like any of a variety of different shield types. Now, Matt's ultimate kind of framing with dual wielding is actually very correct, and he deserves to be given credit for coming to the correct conclusion in this part for what is ultimately a fairly sophisticated subject in regards to melee combat. And it's that if you're going to be using anything in your offhand and you have the option, you're always going to be using a shield because something that dual wielding is terrible at <laughs> is protecting yourself against arrow fire, which funnily enough, in the reverse, uh, shields are brilliant at. However, that's not to say that there's no historical evidence of dual wielding. And in most cases, nearly anything is better than just your fist. Heck, even something as simple as a stick is going to provide better defense and longer offensive reach than just your arm. This is also correct. And to just add a little bit more onto that, sometimes on top of like shields and other weapons, a gauntlet was used in the offhand for a primary, you know, defense. If it was gauntleted, you could knock aside and cloaks as well. I would wrap up the offhand in a cloak because really thick material, especially when it's layered a lot, can actually deflect sword strikes quite effectively and other bladed implements as well. This is the whole, you know, point behind Gambeson cloth textile armor is that it's actually effective armor and was used quite a lot. Most of the time, the technique was used for one-on-one -on -one duels with two different weapons, a longer sword for attacking and a short sword or dagger for defense. In fact, defensive daggers became so popular that the parrying dagger was designed with defense in mind, sporting advanced knuckles guards and cross guards. All right, yes. So Matt Pat points out some correct historical references of dual wielding being done in the past. That's great. The dagger he shows as a parrying dagger is a very poor example, but then he later shows a better example. And so it's interesting. Sometimes I think his editors might do him a disservice because they show the wrong thing that is actually being referred to in the voiceover. But dual wielding was a thing that we see more often done in duels, funnily enough. It was also done as a novelty. Does this mean it was never done on the battlefield? No, it was very likely someone somewhere did it on the battlefield. And Matt Pat kind of points out some of this, these examples that if you're on the battlefield and you lost your shield and you're using a one-handed weapon, anything is better than a bare hand. Like Matt Easton points this out in his video when talking about dual wielding two shields as well, is that you could pick up a chair in your offhand and it would still be better than a bare fist. By the way, using two shields at the same time has been addressed multiple times in our community, not by me, funnily enough, but Scarlagram, 
Scholar Gladiatoria, Metatron, have all addressed the dual wielding shield idea, and I'm going to be referencing some of the things I say in this video as I'm doing right now. And so, in that case, if you could just pick up any weapon and it was a sword or an axe, you're better off having a weapon in your offhand than having nothing at all. Turning our attention eastward, the Japanese in the medieval era used shields far more sparingly than their European counterparts. An emphasis on horse archery combined with the unique benefits of the Japanese armor made handheld shields more of a hindrance to the movement than a defensive boot. Yes, for horse archery, but the unique benefits of Japanese armor? I, I wish Matt would have qualified this because what is he referring to specifically? What are the unique benefits of Japanese armor that makes shields uh, awkward or, you know, a not a good pick? He specifically says that handheld shields are more of a hindrance to movement than a defensive boost. And that's baffling. Like, there's nothing about Japanese armor that would make it that way. Uh, interesting thing about Japanese armor, and uh, this is actually addressed in Metatron's video on using two shields at the same time, and certain types of Japanese armor had an interesting quality in which their, their, their shoulder guards, the European name being pauldrons, are very large and very shield-like. And as I've found in one of my own videos and shown the historical references, you can wear a shield and still, you know, fight effectively. And the European references, you're wearing a much larger shield, but still use two hands on whatever weapon, a spear or something like that. And so the concept of wearing a shield isn't anything new. And Metatron points out that, you know, this type of Japanese armor, they're essentially wearing two shields on either side. So is that an eye concept of dual wielding shields? No, because they're not actively using them, they're wearing it. But is this what MatPat is referring to? But even with this type of armor, you could definitely still use a handheld shield and the armor isn't going to make it like hinder your movement and make you less of an efficient fighter. So th that statement is a bit baffling and incorrect. It was during this time period that the samurai began carrying two different swords, the longer katana for battle and the shorter wakazashi for ritual purposes. So the katana actually wasn't a battlefield weapon or like at the very least, it wasn't a primary battlefield weapon. It's never, not to say it was never used on the battlefield, but if you're actually looking for the Japanese sword that was used more often on the battlefield, it's the earlier form of the katana, the tashi, which is also bigger. And so it's a longer sword, which makes it more effective on the battlefield and just in combat generally. And so the idea that the katana is a, you know, perfect battlefield weapon is, no, that's completely incorrect. It's a great weapon for personal self-defense. Uh, it's a weapon of status wearing when you're just about your everyday. That's where it comes into play. And that's also one of the reasons, not the only, but one of the reasons why having it a bit shorter than the Tashi was also more convenient if you're wearing it just regularly in everyday clothing. So no, the Japanese katana actually isn't a battlefield weapon. What about what we see in Assassin's Creed Valhalla where we see Eivor dual wielding two very similar looking axes? But in my research, I wasn't able to find any historical examples of dual wielding axes specifically. Now he then says that he found no historical references of Vikings wielding two axes axes. And that's interesting because when I heard that, being familiar with the nature of uh, Icelandic and Norse sagas, I felt, you know, I bet there's a reference somewhere in there. Because when it comes to Viking, Icelandic, Norse sagas, they're actually very clear on the types of weapons being used by the combatants in them. It's like they, they like the combat, okay, when it comes to these sagas. There is a caveat that needs to be mentioned, that these sagas are not perfectly representative of history. They're far more heroic in their tales. And some of the people in them are doing some fairly unrealistic things, but it does at least give us a point of reference. And just for the sake of having more resources, I'm going to share some of the historical references in these sagas that specifically refer to simply dual wielding two weapons. And then I will share my reference to dual wielding two axes. So in regards to the historical references of cultures that went a Viking, we have one from Jal saga, it's spelled N-J-A-L, so I think that's uh, pronounced Jal. Then each man edged on the other and Gunnar guarded himself with his bow and arrows as long as he could. After that he threw them down and then he takes his bill and sword and fights with both hands. Direct reference to dual wielding. Also in the same saga, there is this reference. Kari caught sight of him and leapt up as the blow fell and stretched his legs far apart and so the blow spent itself on the ground but Kari jumped down on the spear shaft and snapped it in sunder. He had a spear in one hand and a sword in the other but no shield. From Cormac Saga, Bursi had a hailbird in one hand and a staff in the other. And okay, so 
dual wielding, it seems to be fairly clear, was done in certain circumstances amongst the cultures that went on a Viking, the Scandinavian cultures, right? But what about dual wielding two axes? And Matt mentioned that he was unable to find any historical example of this being done. And I think it's from the fact that when you're not familiar with the subject matter, you don't really know where to begin looking. And the primary place to look for something like this is in the sagas, okay? So I went online to a website that had most of the sagas there translated in English and did a word search on each one with the keyword axe. And it only took me about, about an hour looking this up, and I found one. It is from the saga of Gisli, the outlaw, and this is Gisli. He's kind of doing a mocking chant to his opponent, and so it's kind of like a story within a story, so as to how accurate, but listen to this. Methought my foeman, axes wielding, both my arms at once lopped off. Wound on wound, no buckler shielding, woe on woe, and a bitter scoff. So, I don't know how accurate the translation is, because that was, that, this has been translated to have rhyming prose, and if the original language had the rhyming prose, usually that isn't carried over so well into English, but uh, the translation specifically says, Methought my foeman, axes wielding, plural, more than one, both my arms at once lopped off. So this implies someone's using two axes and chopped someone's arms lopped off um, at once, specifically, which means you need two implements to chop off two arms. And so axes more than one, this is clearly actually describing someone dual wielding two axes from a Norse saga, the saga of Gisli. So, there is historical precedent for it. Does this mean that it was done often? Most likely, no. It would have been an exceptional thing out of the ordinary and in a situation where you didn't have many other options. Now, Matt makes a kind of comparison in dual wielding axes to dual wielding hook swords and that they're somewhat axe-like in the sense that they have hooks on the end. And then there's an odd statement. He says the main advantage of the axe is the hook. The main advantage of the axe is the hook under the blade. So one axe could catch the opponent's weapon or shield, pull it away, leaving the body exposed for the blow of the second axe, just like with the hook swords. That's the good news. Which is very odd, because first of all, uh, part is called the beard. This is the beard of an axe, and if an axe has something like this, it's a bearded axe. And second, not all axes have them. So it's not an inherent advantage of the axe. And the other thing, uh, if you have a bearded axe, it's not the main advantage of the axe. The main advantage is, of course, uh, the actual bladed striking end being able to kill your opponent. It is an advantage, of course, granted, but the main advantage? No. So, could you dual-wield axes? Sure, you could. Would you want to? Honestly, only in very limited situations where there's almost nothing else to use. And in the Valhalla trailer, Eivor is surrounded by abandoned boss grip shields. Yes, MatPat is 100% correct on this. Would you dual-wield axes if you have a shield available? No, especially on a battlefield where yeah, there's likelihood of getting shot by an arrow. Oh my goodness. And now we come to shields, and Matt starts to talk about the offensive capacity of the shield. And uh, he makes uh, like a, a, an accurate assessment of one way in which you can strike a shield, but what's odd is he seems to completely ignore the other way in which you could strike with a shield, which is very odd because it's actually shown striking that way in the video game footage he is showing. Is there ever any reason to dual wield a shield? Okay, so Matt does mention striking on the edge of the shield here. The most effective way to use the shield as a weapon is by using its edge. But then his later example completely ignores striking on the edge. Think about why an arrow or a bullet works. They put all of the pressure on as small of a point as they can, creating a single point of maximum impact. A shield does basically the exact opposite, spreading the force behind it as much as possible. When you're attacking, it just means that you're going to be making less of an impact over a larger surface area. So yes, you can hit someone with the flat of the shield, which is much more inefficient than hitting someone with the edge of the shield, like so. Uh, and Matt doesn't see, I acknowledge that, because he's right in the sense that the force is dispersed over a very large surface area when you're just kind of hitting or trying to slap someone. Yeah, he's ignoring the hit, striking with the side of the shield, like so. That concentrates the force on a decently small surface area and has the potential to do some serious damage. And so even when you actually have a weapon, you know, in your offhand, it is usually because of, it's got, 
you know, depending on period, because this one has a better cross guard than most uh, Viking period swords. And so with less hand protection, shield held forward, and not always like this, sometimes on the side like so, getting ready. Because the shield is already close to the opponent, there's a lot of opportunity sometimes to do a jab with it and then follow up with a sword strike or something. And sometimes the jab can actually do damage or it can make an opening to follow up with a strike, keeping the shield forward as you do it. So shields do have a level of offensive capacity and the statement but with dual wielding both of your hands are on different shields and your offensive ability effectively drops to zero. It is literally the opposite of what you want. Effectively drop to zero? No because as I explained just previously shields do have a level of offensive capacity much better than just slaps okay there and we even see the big kind of wide hits like this in the actual gameplay footage and that could do some damage if you landed a solid hit. Is it the best um, scenario? Of course not. If you have the option for a weapon in your main hand, you would drop this you know, other shield and pick up a weapon. But if it was your only option, it could have been done. It would be tiring because even these foam ones, when you hold them out like that, or moving around a lot, can actually start to feel pretty heavy. So you'd be better picking up a stick or something like that. But seriously, if you had uh, no other option and there was two shields around, it could be done. Were there scenarios in which someone actually did it in the past? Well, there's some interesting points of reference. Uh, Matt Easton from Scholar Gladiatoria talks about uh, shield bearers, okay, that they might have actually been carrying more than one shield for their knight or lord or whatever. And if they get caught out and they're holding two shields, well, there's a scenario. Um, Metatron mentions that in a Tustudu kind of formation, it's like doubling up the shields because they got one low and there's one going over top like that. So that's kind of doubling up. But in rounding off this point, saying that there's no offensive capacity dual wielding shields, like you could hold one out for defense, you could be jabbing forward with this one and you could switch them over and you could do wide hits like this, bringing the defense back up. And so there is a level of effect and I think it's better than being unarmed, especially if the opponent has weapons. And so th there is some use. It's just in comparison to nearly any other perhaps not any other, but most other practical weapon, you know, combinations, they're, they're all better, okay? But there is some historical documentation about shields with spikes sticking out of them appearing during the Dark and Middle Ages, most notably used by the armies of William the Conqueror. <laughs> What did he just say? Alrighty, you know, up to now I've been, I have been correcting some fairly blatant factual errors, but this one by far is the largest and most egregious one, because <laughs> like seriously? <laughs> William the Conqueror used spike shields a, a lot in his armies? Like, like when I heard that, I was just, you know, that was kind of my reaction, a spit take. Where did he hear that? Because my goodness, and I mean, when hearing something so contrary to my current understanding, I, I do question myself, like, did I miss something? Is there, is there something throughout my many years of being, you know, passionate about the video, and I've studied the Battle of Hastings, you know, the main battle William the Conqueror led, and he led other battles as well, but this is the main point of reference we have for his army, right? I studied it several times. Not once did spike shields come up, but okay, I mean, like, giving the benefit of the doubt, I looked it up. And uh, the only reference I found doing a Google search, and I wonder if this is what MatPat found as well. There's this reference from this website that says that William the Conqueror had spike shields as depicted on the Bayer Tapestry. The danger of researching things on the internet is that not every source is reliable. When you hear something, you generally want to get it confirmed by multiple sources. And especially if it is contrary or contradicts certain standards that you're already aware of, because even not having MatPat hearing anything, but see, if I saw this website and I saw this one saying the Bayer Tapestry shows spike shields, I'd be like, I've studied the Bayer Tapestry. I'd never seen spike shields on it. So to confirm this, I went to the Bayer Tapestry and I looked at the whole thing. It's really long, okay? Every shield. And you know what I found? Uh, probably a misinterpretation. Uh, so look at these shields right here. Um, they are, the bosses are pointed. No actual spikes. If you're going to be seeing a very like a spike shield that you could easily identify as a spike shield, there would be like a line showing a spike, not a pointed boss. 
The other reason why we can know that these are pointed bosses and not spiked bosses is archaeological remains. We have found pointed bosses, but I have not been able to find any remains of spiked bosses from this period. In actual fact, most of these pointed bosses have distinct flattened tips, not spikes. Does this mean that spike shields might not have existed somewhere during this period? Of course not. It's possible somewhere. It's not that a difficult invention, okay? We can make a metal spike, we can put it through a boss and have it pointing out there. Okay, but to say that there is direct historical reference to state that William the Conqueror used spike shields in his army to a large amount is utter as cold. No, that is not correct. <laughs> Unfortunately, it gets worse because Matt then shares an image and this isn't an, a mistake by the editor because in the actual voiceover, Matt specifically mentions the type of shield, uh, the Taj, the spiked Taj. <sighs> this, this, one's, this one's a big one. I'm sorry, Matt, but this is... Ugh. These spiked shields tended to be round, thin, targe styled shields with the boss of the shield equipped with a massive spike coming out of the center. The word Taj in the late medieval period was actually the more common name for shield. And so many medieval shields that are identified as Tages in medieval texts are actually not what the more common understanding of the shield type Taj currently is. The type that MatPat is actually showing and representing here. The Taj is a shield 500 years out of period for William the Conqueror, okay? Um, it was used in the 17th century by the Scottish Highlanders. Um, it's, it's not a medieval shield, mate. I'm sorry. Not at all. Uh, this is a very late period shield that you're saying William the Conqueror effectively used. That is, that's a hell. That's that big, okay? Uh, no. No, 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 no. No. Uh, the Taj, like I said, strapped on shield. Uh, there are some earlier examples, of course, but nothing as early as the 11th century. My goodness. Okay. Shields of this period were usually center gripped, not strapped on, usually much larger, and usually not spiked. Uh, we know from archaeological finds, the artwork, and many historical references and stuff. Oh boy. Uh, yeah, well. And considering Assassin's Creed Valhalla takes place in 9th century England, there's definitely a chance Eivor could come across one of these bad boys in his journey. No, that is not correct. And yes, I'm reusing this clip because it's very effective and it gets the point across. I think someone should clip it and turn it into a meme. And it gets worse again because what happens next... Matt starts to talk like literal, it uh, feels like he's pulling this stuff out of his rear end. Um, because, and I think it's because he's going off this misinformation that he's found saying that there, there are spike shields on the Bay of Tapestry, ergo William the Conqueror, because the Bay of Tapestry depicts the Battle of Hastings led by William the Conqueror. Um, and it gets all muddled because you won't find spike shields in large formations, okay? Like, look at the reference point picture that Matt brings up of the um, reenactors, okay? And, his, and he says specifically, Fighting during this era happened in tight masses of people, and the spikes were meant to control distance and angles from which an opponent could attack. But the spikes became a nuisance quickly in these sorts of battles, either getting in the way, getting caught on various objects, or just poking your allies in the back. They didn't become a nuisance in these sorts of battles because they were never used in these sorts of battles. The picture you're showing, a reenactment group, they're, they're, they're certainly not using them. And I think he's just making a leap where he's looked up reenactments that they're not there and then just made up bullcrap saying, well, oh, they, they, they just, they, they mustn't have been used on the battle, in this type of battle, because they became a nuisance. No, 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 no. They were never used in large numbers. If they ever were, it was a very, very small exception because... Someone somewhere might have done it, but speaking generally, no. No, 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 no. And the assumption that the spikes on shields were meant to control distance and angle from which the opponents could attack? <sighs> the, the, the main purpose of spikes on shields is to stab your opponent. That, that, that's the main purpose. And yes, it can be used in some measure of deflection, but hold the thought, right? Imagine there is a spike coming out of the center boss of this shield, and it'll be about yay long, okay? Would that be able to deflect anything any better, any better than the circumference of the shield already? I would say nay. A big nay. Uh, so the purpose of the spike is not for deflection if the shield can do far better and anything that the spike could potentially deflect, the shield would probably do anyway. 
His point about control distance, maybe. Okay, if you have a spike on the end of the shield uh, and you're, you know, there's a potential spike, spike, you know, careful getting too close, yeah, you could use it to control a bit of distance. Same with your regular main handed weapon uh, and perhaps the edge of the shield. Maybe. So I can see how this mistake might have been made because there is a reference on the internet that I found at least saying that uh, there's spike shield shown on the Bayo Tapestry, which I disagree with, having looked directly at the Bayo Tapestry. Uh, but then the leaps in logic he's made from there, I feel shows a very uh, a poor mindset for accurate research uh, because the, the statements he's made are unqualified, uh, like, you know, uh, deflect more or anything like that and that then making the assumption that they were you they became a nuisance in this type so they were just I like that that's utter conjecture based on false evidence which means it's all bullcrap and please never do that that's that's really bad as a research standard <laughs> like really bad in the, these are the type of instances that mate please send me an email single email Hey, Shad, mate, is this correct? And I can tell you straight off the bat, it's like, wow, because even hearing that without double checking, even before I knew, it's like, that is off. That is something very wrong with that statement. It's like, gosh. Uh, and it's unfortunate because, like I said, mate, you make good videos. And this video could have been so much better with some accurate information because. Goodness! Look at the battlefield in the Valhalla trailer. Everyone is tightly packed, practically fighting on top of each other. Yeah, small nitpick, but are we watching the same footage? Because this is not tightly packed. I consider it quite the opposite in comparison to how close military units are supposed to remain to each other to maintain an actual unit formation. We're not seeing that one bit. Oh, throw your shield down, huh? Yeah. Bet you wish you didn't now. I took her head off with an arrow? My first thought was that there was no chance that this could ever be possible in real life. But then I saw this from the channel ZBG Studios, short for Zombie Go Boom. All right, now we get to the archery subject of this video, which I'm a bit excited about because if you've been watching my content recently, you know, I've... Uh, I've been getting into uh, medieval warbow uh, quite a lot and having a decent amount of success with it. Okay, so could a medieval warbow shoot an arrow in such a way that it could decapitate someone? The answer to this is, of course, as Matt Easton would say, a healthy dose of context. Uh, because we have seen it done. Um, Matt shows something from Zombie Go Boom. Zombie Go Boom, great guys. But in addition to that, my boy, Lars Anderson, has also shown that, that as well, okay? Shooting a special type of arrow to chop off a zombie's head. So can it be done with a bow? Yes. Could it be done with a medieval war bow in the context of the medieval period? No, unless you're extremely lucky. Why? Let me explain, it would be my pleasure. The first issue is the problem with arrowheads, but I'm gonna come back to that later because that will follow on uh, from an initial point that should be addressed first, which is the, if you could even be that accurate, okay? Uh, because Matt unfortunately makes some pretty big errors about types of Viking arrowheads. But first of all, uh, medieval bows, okay? A war bow, funnily enough, is very difficult to pull back. The standard bow that you will find in most archery ranges has a draw force. The amount of force you actually need to pull back to fully draw the bow is about 30 pounds of force. And uh, it goes between 30 and 45, and a 50 pound bow is considered a heavier bow with standard target archery, Olympic style target archery. It's in the heavier category. This is a war bow. It has a draw strength of 100 pounds. That is twice as heavy as the heavy category of standard target bows. And it changes many things, especially in regards to uh, how stable and accurate you can be. First of all, it's a matter of stance and drawing. These bows are so heavy, drawing just with a you know single arm motion is actually really difficult and also dangerous. It's a higher chance of causing injury on your shoulder. To draw a war bow, it's a compound movement where you engage your shoulders, your back in one motion together to pull it back like that. Now, what I just did there might have looked easy, but when I first got it, I couldn't pull it back. And also to show you just as a point of reference as to how difficult pulling one of these bows are, guys that are twice as big as me in terms of muscle mass and could just wipe the floor with me in an arm wrestle, 
can't actually draw bows like this because it uses such a specific muscle set that you need to trade up and do. Have a look at Jörg Sprave. He is a unit and I've collabed with him. This is him actually holding this very bow, trying to draw this bow. It is a super heavy bow. And I have to say that even though I have these gloves on, it is very hard for me to pull it. And that is not the full draw, of course. I think it's not possible for me to draw it in full. And that is not because I'm weak. I'm not weak, I don't think so. I mean, in weightlifting, I can still, at my age of almost 55, I can really move some iron. But these, these bows need a different kind of muscle set that you can only get by shooting longbows, heavy longbows. And Jörg could smash me in an armor. So the guy is probably twice as strong as me, yet he can't draw the bow because it uses a, such a specific muscle set. And technique, okay, is actually more pulling with one arm and not doing the compound movement to draw it. Now in the compound movement, at holding that weight, it's actually harder to loose cleanly and keep the arrow on target. And you can get very accurate, but the context of medieval accuracy with a war bow is different to the context of accuracy or, or what you would consider very accurate in a modern sense. To demonstrate, when you're aiming at a human-sized target, anything that hits the target is the equivalent of a bullseye. So, with that in mind, could I be more pinpoint accurate to always get, say, the neck if I'm always aiming for it? Well, let's try that out. Huh. That was, a, that was much better than I was expecting. All right, um, all right. I'm, but I didn't get the neck. Okay, so that was a kill shot, but let's see if I can get the neck. Oh, that was that far away from the neck. Why can't you become pinpoint accurate with a war bow? You can get really accurate, okay, uh, to a point probably a grouping like say big, but to get the neck consistently, you will need a grouping this big, regularly and consistently. And uh, one of the issues is the archer's paradox. You might have known about it. The arrow will always have a certain amount of contact with the shaft of a war bow, especially if it's bigger. This is my new war bow, and I can't even draw it yet, and it has a 120 pound draw strength. And look at how thick it is, okay? I actually have a video talking about all the unique, interesting things about this bow. So if you want to see a video of me tugging on this thick, meaty shaft, well, go watch that video because I can't even draw it yet. And because the shaft is so thick, okay, the arrow is always going to have a certain amount of contact with it when it looses, which means it's going to wobble more than stay straight. To get pinpoint accurate, like we see in Olympic level, you need arrows that are perfectly weighted, calibrated to the bow, so they curve around the shaft and they have as stable arrow flight as possible. But arrows were re rarely ever weighted to the uh, bow in a medieval setting. In actual fact, we don't even know if they knew about it, okay? I think it makes logical sense that some archers figured out that, hey, this arrow shot a lot cleaner on my bow than this other one. I'll put it aside, and perhaps they put several aside until they had a clump. But when they're going to war, they got issued a sheaf from the king, and the, the arrow weights and spine strengths completely random, okay? Um, and so they were never going to be perfectly calib calibrated. And if you're having, if you're shooting arrows that are not calibrated to the bow, you're never going to get pinpoint accuracy. And because of that, you're never going to hit rare reliably on the neck. And the other problem about shooting a medieval war bow to decapitate someone with a special type of arrowhead is that arrows, they spin, okay? And the arrowhead would need to hit flat, okay, to get the width to actually chop off there. And this is even in Lars Anderson's one. Now, a master like Lars Anderson can measure the spin so perfectly or something happens where he can do it reliably and is, a, is amazing. But with a war bow, no. And uh, just while we're here, okay, because in my other video, I wasn't able to draw it, but I think I've healed up a bit. I'm going to try and draw it again and see if I can draw this a little bit further, okay? So... Oh, I got it further back, I reckon, but I'm not at full draw yet. Gosh, this is hard. So the level of accuracy that would have been considered more than adequate enough in a medieval context would be if you could reliably hit a human-sized target at a decent distance. And any hit on that human-sized target is equivalent to a bullseye. 
And as I said, they can hone their sight picture closer in, but there comes a level where there is simply a mechanical limitation with the setup of what a warbow is and what the types of arrows existed in the medieval period. So unfortunately, you're rarely going to see a perfect equivalent of Lars Anderson or a medieval Legolas in a proper medieval context. Just for the fun of it, do you see how deeply these war arrows landed in? Okay, these arrows are, are big and heavy, went right through the guy. <laughs> now, it's not a perfect analog for a human being, but you would not want to be in there like that. As you can imagine, that fancy type of expanding arrowhead wasn't used back in 9th century England. But you know what was its ancestor? The basic broadhead arrow. The next part we need to address is the type of arrows. Matt Pat seems to imply that a decent sized broadhead could take off someone's head. And no. Oh, I mean, so there's a number of problems. First of all, the types of broadhead that Matt Pat is talking about. You see, early Viking arrowheads used in battle were exactly the same types of arrows that they used in hunting. Flat, made of metal, and approximately five to seven centimeters long, five centimeters wide, and with a barb on both sides designed to cut through skin and stick in the body. This one is a little uh, disappointing because it's such an easy thing to double check, mate. All you have to do is Google search types of Viking arrowheads that simple and you'll get all the references you need all there and you'll see not only does the type of broadhead that is referring to not seem to exist in the viking period or at the very least wasn't used often it also shows that vikings had bodkin type arrowheads which matt pat says in the video was a later development as time went on and armor became more sophisticated new arrowhead types called bodkins were developed that were longer and narrower losing the barbs and being designed instead to pierce through chain mail no they had bodkins and he says that they used the same type of arrowheads in combat as they did in hunting. No. You know, because he says that the better type of arrowhead for battle is the bodkin, which is exactly what they used if they had them and they did have them. They used the bodkin because it was far better at pe penetrating armor. A broadhead is of course better at flesh, but the Vikings, as I mentioned, doesn't look like it had many broadheads. They had barbed arrowheads, and look, that could be considered a broadhead, but not the type that Matt is referring to. Matt is referring to a very wide, big type of broadhead. And uh, if you want to consider the barbed types of arrowheads, the Vikings used broadheads, they're not nearly big enough to do the job that is saying they should be able to do. Nowhere near. So in summary, understanding all this in context, if you had a big enough type of broadhead and you got a really lucky shot, a war bow actually would have easily enough power to take off someone's head, but doing it intentionally, purposefully, and reliably, consistently, no. No, because one, the types of arrowheads doesn't seem to be very common, if at all, in the Viking period, and that type of accuracy, as I mentioned, with medieval-style bows, war bows, and the fact they spin, it's not gonna happen. Remind me again, who is the main antagonist of the Assassin's Creed series? Oh yeah, the Templars, the most wealthy and powerful of the Western Christian military orders. And now we've come to the end with only one last correction. Uh, that's not a Knight Templar, it's a Knight Hospitaller. Hos Hospitaller? Hospitaller? You can correct me on the pronunciation, but it's not a Knight Templar. Uh, it's not hospital. Yeah. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this video and somewhere in the middle as well, this isn't an attack. I think you make great videos, mate. This is just correcting some pretty large factual errors in your video to encourage discussion, back and forth, education, and all that stuff as well. And as I mentioned, that, that invitation is always open, mate. I'm more than happy for you to ask me any questions at all. If you ever have a video that comes up in the future that dances around the, you know, the analysis of weapons and armor and medieval history and all that stuff. So thank you guys for watching. I hope you have enjoyed. And I, I'll also end off by saying, please don't rag on Matt Pat. We all make mistakes. I make mistakes as well, a lot, okay? So uh, it happens but it also is a chance for further discussion. I think it's a good thing that Matt made his video. I would not have wanted him to not have made it because it just gives an opportunity, further discussion, and now people who probably weren't interested in this or wasn't even on their radar, if you watch Matt's video and then you've come and watched mine, seeing Matt's video was the catalyst in learning a bit more about the accurate context of certain medieval weapons and armor. So, as I mentioned, I hope you've enjoyed, and of course, I hope to see you again. So until that time, Fair one.